Hi, my name is Laura, and welcome to my podcast, Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations, and through these discussions, you will hear why, nine times out of ten, the book wins. I'll also share different behind-the-scenes trivia I've discovered in my research, which by learning makes the story all the more interesting. If you love either books, movies, or both, this is the perfect podcast for you. This probably already goes without saying, but there will be spoilers for both the book and the movie in this podcast. So if you plan on reading the book or watching the movie, go do that first and then come back and listen to this. And now without further ado, let's get right into it. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. Today, as you can see, the topic is Girl Interrupted. It is a book written by Susanna Kaysen in 1994 and then it was directed or it was made into a movie by the same name released in 1999 and directed by James Mangold. The synopsis for this, a very brief synopsis, it is a memoir written by Susanna Kaysen about her own 18th month stint at a mental institution when she was 18 years old. She tells of a few of the more memorable stories that took place while she lived there, and she has certain chapters dedicated to particular girls she met while she was there. And one girl in particular is named Lisa, and the movie really focuses on Lisa. The book also goes into her life after being discharged, whereas the movie ends with her leaving the institution. So my thoughts on the book, honestly, I wasn't a huge fan. It was just all right, I thought. It was really short, so there's that. Uh, And it was written in a unique way because it's not written linearly. So instead, she has each chapter cover a different story, or each chapter covers a specific person. So she'll have one chapter, for example, talking about Daisy, who is a character in the book and the movie. So this chapter will be about Daisy, and the chapter ends with Daisy dying, because that's what happens. But then a few chapters later, she'll be talking about some story that took place, and Daisy is there because she was part of the event. So her 18-month timeline, it just kind of jumps around in the book, which I, I like that. I thought it was a unique style. I just, yeah, I just wasn't particularly taken with her story, and I, yeah, I just thought it was okay. (laughs) As far as the movie, uh, unlike myself, Winona Ryder was very taken with the book. She bought the rights to it and waited a few years till she was able to make it into a movie. She chose director James Mangold, who later went on to direct Walk the Line, 310 to Yuma, Ford vs. Ferrari, and some of the Wolverine movies, which I'm not a fan of the superhero genre but the other three movies walk the line and 310 to yuma and ford vs ferrari i do like a lot the movie is much more eventful than the book which is to be expected because as i said the book it wasn't like your normal plot novel or something it was just a memoir and it wasn't exactly it wasn't riveting so the movie did a good job making the story more interesting And as far as acting, we have Winona Ryder, who is in the lead role of Susanna. I like Ryder as an actress, and she's good in this. However, there are scenes where she's playing an 18-year-old, but she definitely looks older than 18. But I guess that's not a huge deal. For some reason, I also didn't love her narration, which there's not a lot of voiceover, but it does happen here and there. And I don't know, something about the way she talks, it just... It didn't sound like Susanna. It sounded like just Winona Ryder. Like, I don't know. So I didn't love that part. Then we have Angelina Jolie, who portrays Lisa, and she won an Academy Award for the role. She was really well cast, and she looks a lot the way Lisa is described in the book. And yeah, her acting is incredible, and she deserved the nomination and the award. Although I don't know who she was running against that year. I didn't look. But she definitely does a good job. And during filming, she would even avoid socializing with the other actors, specifically Winona Ryder, in order to keep that sociopathic mindset. So Winona Ryder and Angelina Jolie are the main two people in this movie, but there are some others that are worth mentioning. We have Elizabeth Moss in the role of the burn victim Polly. Moss, of course, went on to showcase her acting skills in the show Mad Men, which is one of the best TV dramas out there, and I highly recommend it. Brittany Murphy does an incredible job playing Daisy, a character who has a very tragic end, but we'll talk more about that later. 
Then, of course, there is Whoopi Goldberg, who is well cast as the kind but no-nonsense nurse, Valerie. And lastly, we have Jared Leto, who is only in about 10 minutes of this movie. And he plays Toby. In the book, Toby was her actual boyfriend. But in the movie, he's a guy that she just hooks up with once before uh, being taken to the mental hospital. Random side note, about 10 years ago or more, I actually did watch part of this movie. And the sole reason I watched it was because it had Jared Leto. Um, So I was going through a bit of a Jared Leto phase, which, I mean, I feel like a lot of girls go through a Jared Leto phase. At least back then. He's gotten, he doesn't, he, I don't know, he's aged all right. He's a bit more weird looking now. That's kind of a funky look. But anyway, back then I was very disappointed at that his role was so small in this because I was hoping to see him more. Anyway, he has gone on to be an Academy Award winning actor and he's also in the band 30 Seconds to Mars. Oh, and an even smaller character that I thought I would mention is a guy Susanna makes out with later in the movie, and he's played by Misha Collins. And Supernatural fans will recognize him as the actor that plays Castiel, which I used to be a big fan of Supernatural. I I got into it like in 2007, and the first two seasons I loved, and the third season I thought was all right. And then by the time I finished the fourth season, I just stopped watching. But they've gone on to do 15 seasons and they like just barely ended. So that's insane. But anyway, so Supernatural fans will recognize Misha Collins' brief role in this movie. So the biggest difference is, for starters, we have Lisa. In both the book and the movie, Lisa is a sociopath who is very skinny and has yellowish skin. In the book, she doesn't sleep, though she is much calmer at night, and she'll even make hot chocolate for whoever else is up. And someone asks her once, like, why she's so much calmer at night? And she's like, just because I don't sleep doesn't mean I don't need to rest. Although that's left out of the movie. Um, And in both the book and the movie, she frequently runs away, but is always caught. And in the book, after one escape, she's put in solitary. And then when she comes out, she's just super, she's just like catatonic and sits in front of the TV all day and all night. And prior to this, she was very against the TV and she would turn it off when people were watching it. So they're all, Susanna's like concerned. Uh, But then one day they wake up and they see that all the light bulbs have been taken out and stuffed in a closet. And it turns out Lisa was faking being like a vegetable and she was just trying to plot a way to get her revenge and she chose taking all the light bulbs out that specific storyline isn't in the movie but they do have lisa they do show her being put into solitary lisa and susanna are very close friends in the movie but in the book susanna was actually closer to her roommate georgina the book also had another girl named lisa cody and lisa cody was really good friends with lisa in the book and over time though because Lisa is a sociopath she would just she would just manipulate the people around her so she just kind of manipulated Lisa Cody and so they had an unhealthy friendship near the end and eventually Lisa Cody is released and but upon when she gets out she becomes a junkie and Lisa is proud of herself because she feels like she contributed to Lisa Cody's worsening addiction and that's a a trait of a sociopath is like taking pleasure in other people's downfall, kind of like like Lisa was proud of herself for getting Lisa Cody to be a junkie. Anyway, there is no Lisa Cody in the movie. And so some some parts of Lisa and Lisa Cody's friendship in the book, they make they have it be Susanna and Lisa's friendship in the movie, which makes sense because Susanna is a main character. So they just make that friendship the focus. And Lisa, like she's, she's sort of the ringleader in the book, I guess you could say. But the movie, they made her very much the center and the leader of the group. And they even have her and her select group of girls in the ward that will sneak out in the middle of the night and they'll go into the tunnels and sometimes break into the offices and have this, you know, special little group of theirs. And none of this happened in the book. The tunnels are part of the book. But they're just like a normal way that nurses get between buildings and they'll take patients down when they want to get from one building to another. And so it's not like some secret passageway the way it is in the movie. Although Susanna does have like a weird obsession with the tunnels in the book. So another one of the changes are in regards to Daisy. 
So Daisy is in both the book and the movie, but there are some changes in regards to her stay at the hospital as well as the details of her death. In both, she is at the hospital and her dad will bring her rotisserie chickens, which she eats in the privacy of her own private room. And everybody else shares a room, but Daisy is the only one who gets her own. And she's hooked on laxatives. And at one point, Lisa is able to get into Daisy's room by bribing her with laxatives. In the book, she also ends up leaving and she moves into an apartment that her dad gets her. So in the book, Daisy was only a part-time patient, though. She would check in every year around November and then she would leave again during like after the holidays in January or something. And then she would just be back again the following November. But she lived with her parents. But the last time she's there, she talks about how this time she was moving into her own private apartment. The movie makes like a very dramatic, her discharge is a very dramatic scene. But in the book, it wasn't dramatic at all because she checked out every year and then she just came back again. Uh, also, the movie has Susanna be the one who uses laxatives to get into her room. Lisa and Lisa like just pushes her way in. So the two of them are there. And while in there, Lisa spies the rotisserie bones under the bed. And then she points it out and Daisy is very embarrassed. And she says that when she gets to five, Valerie makes her throw them out. Whereas in the book, as I said, Lisa is the only one who gets into the room. And afterwards, she's telling the other girls about how when she was in there, Daisy had 12 eaten rotisserie chicken bones laid out. So she wasn't hiding them. They were just out in the open. And she tells Lisa that when she gets to 19, that's when she leaves. In both, Daisy talks about how she's moving into an apartment, as I said, that her dad got for her. And in the movie, there's a scene where we overhear her describing the apartment to someone while they're in the ice cream parlor. And the way she describes it in that scene is like word for word how she describes it in the book which while on the topic of the ice cream parlor so in the book they go and out to get ice cream and it's pretty uneventful a pretty uneventful story in the movie they make it a bit more interesting because a woman that knows Susanna sees her there and she goes up to her and is saying how like saying mean things to Susanna basically and then Lisa like says a mean comment back to the lady and then All the girls just end up getting the lady and scaring her away, basically. And then, so in the book, the hospital gets word that Daisy has committed suicide and everyone is very upset about it. Whereas the movie, they turn this into a much more pivotal, climactic moment. So for starters, they have Lisa and Susanna escape together, which in the book, Susanna never tries to escape. But so in the movie, Lisa and Susanna escape together and they go to Daisy's to rest before continuing on. While they're there, Lisa torments Daisy with all sorts of mean comments, and Susanna doesn't try to interfere. She just covers her ears and is like, ah, I guess she says, like, shut up or something, but she doesn't really try to protect Daisy or stop Lisa. And then in the morning, Daisy has a song playing on repeat, and so Susanna goes upstairs to check on her, and she ends up finding Daisy's dead body, and she goes into hysterics, understandably. Meanwhile, Lisa comes upstairs, and of course, she is not sympathetic at all. And she even checks Daisy's pockets for money. This is a super powerful scene. The whole scene at Daisy's house, I think, is the most well done, I would say. Murphy is amazing as Daisy. And the scene where Lisa is insulting her is so incredible, not just because Jolie, Jolie's monologue is very impressive, but also just Murphy's reacting to what Jolie is saying is just really good. And then when they find her body, Jolie and Ryder give such great performances. And of course, their characters are acting completely different in response to Finding Daisy. But so that was a really the most powerful part of the movie, I thought, was at Daisy's house. Also, Murphy, Brittany Murphy, who plays Daisy, she sadly died at a very young age. She was 32 and she died of pneumonia, but they did find lots of prescription drugs in her system. And... Yeah, I remember when that happened and it was really sad. Uh, But anyway, after taking Daisy's money, Lisa then leaves. But Susanna stays and calls the cops and they take her back to the hospital. Because of this event, she ends up having a breakthrough. She opens up more in therapy and actually makes progress in her recovery. Lisa eventually does get caught once again. And there is a final dramatic scene where... It's in the middle of the night and Lisa stole Susanna's journal and she goes down to the tunnels with the other girls and is reading what Susanna has written about them. And this part plays out like a scary movie. Like Susanna is 
going the tunnels trying to follow Lisa's voice and then when she does find them she ends up like Lisa she's trying to run away from Lisa and Lisa's chasing her and you know Lisa is very pale and ghostly looking and while she's running I actually thought she was going to end up dying or something I thought they were going to have Lisa accidentally fall and die but instead they just have this moment where they're just being really straight with each other and Lisa ends up breaking down and crying, which based on my limited knowledge, are like, are sociopaths able to be hurt by what others say? Like, could someone make a sociopath break down and cry the way Lisa does right then? I don't think they can, but I don't actually, I've never, I don't know anyone who's a sociopath. So my only information is what I've read on the internet. So I feel like it's not accurately portrayed, but I could be wrong. Anyway, the next day before Susanna leaves, she goes to see Lisa, who is now like they've all gone back upstairs and Lisa is now strapped in a bed and they have this close moment. And, you know, because Susanna is getting checked out and Lisa says something and Susanna is like, oh, you'll get out of here someday, too. And when you do, come find me. And they have this soft moment. And again, I feel like it's an inaccurate portrayal of sociopaths. Like, can someone who's a diagnosed sociopath suddenly just have some kind of breakthrough and start having strong feelings suddenly because in that moment when they're having their special moment while she's in bed it's it's supposed to be like a touching moment but I feel like it just is an inaccurate portrayal but maybe I'm wrong I don't know anyway the book does not have any of this happen like I said though the book is just a memoir and so there is no like climax to the book But of course, a movie needs a climax because you got to keep it interesting. So it makes sense that they added those changes. And in regards to the end with Susanna's healing and her life after the hospital, in the movie, as stated above, Susanna, you know, has her cathartic experience, which helps her open up and heal. And you get out of therapy what you put into it. So when she actually puts in the work, she begins to heal. And even though the movie shows her being diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, The movie sort of makes it seem like it was a wrong diagnosis and that she just had things she needed to work on, like to improve her mental health. So in the end, they have her discharged because of all the progress she's made, although she does say she's going to continue seeing her therapist twice a week. The ending is just very uplifting. It's or it's meant to be uplifting. I thought it was a bit too, I don't know, a bit too happy of an ending personally, but... So the book, she does not have that cathartic experience. So the way she is discharged is because at some point in her stay, she's given privileges to leave and she even has a job. She just comes back at the end of the day. And one evening she goes out with a friend and she meets a guy who is a friend of the friend. Susanna isn't especially smitten with him, but he is, he takes a liking to her. And as time goes by, he eventually proposes to her. And since she's engaged, that is what allows her to be discharged is simply the fact that she's going to have a husband. And not much is actually said of her husband, though, because she wasn't truly in love with him and they do end up getting divorced. There is a chapter in the book where she says that years later is when she actually read her hospital file. And that was the first time she knew she saw she was diagnosed with a borderline personality d- disorder. So for like a decade or two, she didn't even know what she was diagnosed with. The movie, though, shows her discovering her diagnosis while she's there because one night they sneak out into the offices and break into their files and read all of their individual diagnoses. Uh, But in the book, she analyzes this diagnosis and she basically says that she feels she was just going through what your average teenager experiences and that she doesn't think she ever had like a mental disorder. She also, in the book, she never really claims never really says that she gained anything from the therapy she did there so very different from the movie where in the movie she did benefit from her time there the book also talks about how she kept in touch with Georgina her roommate and she even goes to see her and her husband and they also have a goat but eventually Georgina does move out of state and they lose touch and then she says that while in the city she once crossed paths with Lisa who had a three-year-old child and They were chatting for a bit and she was surprised at just how put together Lisa was. But then near the end of her conversation, Lisa like comes in close and, you know, she gets that mischievous look in her eye and she's like, check this out. 
And she shows Susanna her stomach, which can now like expand super far because of having been pregnant. And then that's it. She doesn't (laughs) mention any of the other people. The movie keeps it pretty vague as far as who is discharged and who she sees again. They have her say in her narration, she has something about how, yeah, she's vague. Like some people I've seen again and others I haven't. So you don't really know for sure. Some of the more minor changes for one, in the book, her parents never visit her, but in the movie, it shows them doing a family therapy session. And then we have Toby. In the book, he was her boyfriend, as I said, and he does visit her once while he's there. But in the book, she's also visited by her high school English teacher, whom she was having an affair with. And so the movie does show this, but they sort of make it seem like it was a one-time thing, whereas in the book, they, they were like dating, I guess. And when the teacher comes to visit her, he tries to convince her to run away with him, but she says no, she wants to stay. And in the movie, they have Toby visit her, and Toby's the one that tries to convince her to leave, but she declines. So they switch that. And also another, I don't know if it's considered minor, I guess it goes along with the change they made to Susanna and Lisa's friendship, but the scene where Polly is put in isolation. And so Susanna and Lisa steal instruments and they drug the head nurse and then they play music to help Polly feel better. That did not happen in the book. And the movie also has the male orderly who likes Susanna. But that also was not in the book. It was actually Georgina and she had a boyfriend in there. Although I think her boyfriend was another patient. I don't think it was an orderly. Valerie also has a much more prominent role in the movie. She's talked about in the book, you know, a a decent amount. But in the movie, she's there for some of, you know, some really big moments. Polly is also a bigger role in the movie, whereas Georgina, the roommate, is a smaller role. And then there's a chapter in the book where her wisdom teeth come in. And so Valerie takes her to her own dentist and she has them removed. And this happens shortly after Daisy's death. And so Susanna is just not doing well emotionally. And she kind of freaks out after having her teeth taken out, she kind of freaks out about having been put under and is upset about the time that was taken from her while she was out. And also around this time, she has a moment where she doesn't think she has bones in her hand. And so she bites her hand to find the bones. Whereas this whole like bones in hand thing that's mentioned in the movie, but that's actually in the very beginning before she tries to overdose on aspirin. And there's also a conversation about the Wizard of Oz early in the movie. And then later, as Susanna is getting better, they show it playing on TV. And it's the scene where Glenda is telling Dorothy that she always had the ability to go home at any time, but she had to come to that realization herself. And then Dorothy is talking about what she had to learn before she goes home. And this is obviously a parallel to Susanna's experience at the hospital, how she always had the power to leave, but there are lessons she needed to learn before she could go. So I thought that was kind of cool. I like it when they have you know, the symbolism and the parallels like that in books and movies. But in the end, if I liked the book or the movie more, I can't say that I loved either one, but if I had to choose to either reread the book or rewatch the movie, I would probably choose the movie. The book, like I said, it just wasn't particularly interesting. And I mean, I'm fine with books not having as much of a plot as long as I as long as I feel like I'm getting something out of it, if it's interesting and I'm learning something. I just, yeah, I don't know. I just didn't get much out of the book. It was just, it was just meh. (laughs) And the movie though, it was entertaining and the acting by everyone was stellar. And so, yeah, if I had to choose one or the other, it would be the movie. So this is one of those rare cases where it isn't the book that wins, but the movie, which my last one, Cool Hand Luke, I also chose the movie. So that's starting to turn into a bit of a pattern here. Anyway, thank you for joining me on today's topic. So lately I've been posting every other week. I might get back to weekly, but join me in two weeks for the next one, which will be Catch Me If You Can, the story of the con man, Frank Abagnale, which is a really interesting story. And it was, yeah, it was a really interesting story to read and a good movie. So tune in for that one next week, or sorry, two weeks from now. (laughs) Thanks. 
Thanks for listening. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, head over to my site, whythebookwins.com. You can leave a comment there and I will be sure to reply. You can also find me on Instagram under the same name, Why the Book Wins, and you can message me there and don't forget to follow. And also don't forget to subscribe to my podcast and join me next Wednesday for the newest episode of Why the Book Wins. Thank you.